Good afternoon, and welcome to this month's virtual edition of Bites and Bits of History, sponsored by the John and Loretta Hines Foundation. I'm Bill Lawson, Executive Director of the Mahoning Valley Historical Society, and we are so pleased at this point that we're now open to the public for regular hours at Arms Family Museum and Tyler History Center. Our hours are Tuesday through Sunday, noon to 4 p.m. at both sites. And the Archives Resource Center at Tyler History Center is open Tuesday through Saturday from noon to 4 p.m. The staff at Business and Media Archives of the Mahoning Valley, located on the Arms Family Museum campus, is available by appointment. For more information, please call 330-743-2589 or visit our website at mahoninghistory.org. Today's Bites and Bits program is Youngstalia, Italian Foodways in the Mahoning Valley, presented by Anthony Dion Mitzel, PhD. Born, raised, and educated in the Youngstown area, Anthony Dion Mitzel is an adjunct professor of linguistics, language, and culture at the alma mater Studorium Università di Bologna, Italy where he teaches courses in applied linguistics, social semiotics, and intercultural and humor studies. Mitzel did his undergraduate studies at Youngstown State University and his graduate work at University College London in the UK. His PhD dissertation is Authenticity and Ephemerality, the Memes of Cultural Production in Italian American Culture, which focuses on the expression of Italian culture around the world and including in Youngstown, Ohio. He is an executive committee member of the Italian American Studies Association. His creative work has been published in journals in Italy and the United States, while he has presented his research at conferences in both Europe and North America. His research interests include linguistics, semiotics, multimodality, culturology, Italian American studies, mimetics, humor studies, and critical mimetic literature. And now, from Cesena, Italy, here is Anthony Mitzel. Thanks, Bill. I'm Anthony Mitzel. Um, I teach at the University of Bologna. I was originally uh, born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio, but for the past 16 years, I've been living in Cesena, Italy. Saturdays and Wednesdays throughout the year, and for well over a hundred years, there's been the market. Now the market is a typical cultural activity that everyone engages in. There's clothing, fruit and vegetables, flowers, and everything that the town needs. But whenever I go to the market, it makes me think about the festivals that took place and still take place in the Mahoney Valley, specifically in Youngstown. And sometimes when I go to this market, I see that these two different cultural expressions as being connected in a way. It's the way that the people interact with each other in a designated space. The way festivals in the valley and markets in Italy still retain some of the communal activities of shared spaces and public interaction. So that's the way the culture becomes preserved and then the people engage with it in their communities. Food. It's what keeps us alive. It's what we grow, make, and more often than not, buy. What we consume, how we consume it, and when and where we consume it, it's all important. 
So when we talk about eating, it is helpful to delineate the space about what we're talking. So, so we have this concept of what is referred to as food ways. And according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, food ways are eating habits and culinary practices of a people, region, or historical period. There are many ways to look at food ways. They can be cultural, they can be social, and often there is also an economic component. All of these practices relate and illuminate the production and consumption of food. Food ways often refer to the intersection of food throughout history, the unique and not so unique traditions in an area, and the culture that supports and maintains food ways. So these three concepts, culture, traditions, and history, I think are pertinent when we look at Youngstown, Ohio. And they'll give us our structure to look at Italian and Italian-American foodways in the Mahoning Valley. In choosing a dream in the immigrant experience, the anguish of becoming an American, Mario Puzo recounted, quote, I had every desire to go wrong, but I never had the chance. The Italian family structure was too formidable. I never came home to an empty house. There was always the smell of supper cooking. My mother was always there to greet me. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, though we were the poorest of the poor, I never remember not dining well. Many years later, as a guest of a millionaire's club, I realized that our poor family on home relief ate better than some of the richest people in America. My mother would never dream of using anything but the finest imported olive oil, the best Italian cheeses. My father had access to the fruits coming off the ships, the produce from railroad cars, all before it went through the stale process of the middleman. And my mother, like most Italian women, was a fine cook in the peasant style. So I think what Puzo's saying here is growing up in New York City is perfectly applicable to Youngstown, Ohio, or to any other Italian enclave of the past. Um, and things have changed considerably, though, since Puzo's time. But I do think that... Uh, food uh, as a historical document still continues to give us an identity and create meaning in our daily lives. So we're going to look at Italian cuisine as a glocal aesthetic. Okay? Um, glocal is a combination of global and local and I think that the Italian American food ways, Italian American cuisine is a perfect example of something that is both very local but then also very global. So the influence on world cuisine and the economic considerations by Italian immigrants cannot be underestimated. One would find it difficult to not come across the ubiquitous Italian pizzeria, trattoria, or in the case of the U.S., an Italian grill. All these places create narratives through their outward signs and connect to an Italy and an American history. And in this culinary give and take, a hybrid form of Italian food outside of Italy began to emerge as well. Old traditional recipes evolved to please different palates and dining expectations. This divide is beautifully illustrated in the film Big Night, where we see the contrast between what is considered authentic Italian food and the less than authentic food at Pascal's, the quote-unquote brother's main competitors. A similocratic or fake Italian dining experience, to say the least. Interestingly, one of the film stars, Stanley Tucci, has a traveling and eating show on CNN at the moment, right now. They just filmed in, in uh, a town very close to my town months ago. It's called Searching for Italy, and we all hope that Stanley finds Italy. But often when I think about Italy, I am really thinking about Youngstown. Because for many of us, our first experience of, or taste of Italy, was outside of Italy, in the Mahoning Valley, in Youngstown, Youngstalia, and the adjacent territory. Now, if like my family, yours came from Italy and settled in Briar Hill, that is your Little Italy, or Italy in diaspora. But each of the city's four corners all had Italian families, and many, many other ethnicities as well. So, while we'll be looking at Italy in the valley, much of what you'll hear applies to everyone in the valley, all ethnicities. We'll just be using Italy and Italian as a frame or as a lens to look at food culture, food with. The Italian dining experience has developed into a sort of acultural cuisine without the obligation of history, yet still containing at times superficial Italian signs with little to no meaning apart 
from the surface understanding of them, often just a hollow shell of Italianità or Italianness, or we could say a cannoli but without the filling, yet the corporatization and commodified style of cuisine being alluded to uh, when we talk about inauthentic food um, is just one component of a larger discussion anchored in discourse on global cultural commodification of Italian food, of Italian sign, outside, but this is kind of outside of what we're going to be talking about. The discourse surrounding the consumer culture and the production of ethnic identity through Italian foodways has grown considerably. One example of the transformative cuisine is diasporic Italian, specifically Italian-American, creation and consumption practices, which include the foodways in Youngstown. Paradoxically, order and a strict adherence to traditional recipes are part and parcel of the Italian peninsular insular Italian dining experience and, generally speaking, fundamental to Italian cuisine. Yet often, these recipes are either a memory or interpretation of an original. Therefore, diasporic Italian American dining places, dining places, less emphasis on the order of the courses yet retains the fundamental signs of an Italian meal through ingredients. And what I mean by order of the courses is a lot of times you will have a protein and a starch put together so a first and a second meal will be combined in a dining experience uh, of Italian food in North America in the United States. So speaking about the interaction between the two variations of Italian family meal, Italian-born and U.S.-raised food scholar Fabio Paracecoli recounts uh, upon meeting cousins when he came to the United States. Food, quote, food, abundant and delicious, eliminated any distance between my numerous cousins and me during that emotional and unforgettable event. I soon realized some of the dishes served had the same names as those I used to eat back home, but they looked and tasted differently. Moreover, the way they were served was new to me. Most dishes came to the table at the same time, and there was no trace of the sequence of appetizers, antipasti, primi, secondi, first, second courses, side dishes, contorni, uh, and desserts, and structured big festive meals in Italy. End quote. Not surprisingly, food and a family meal close, closed the space between Paracecoli, from Italy as the center of Italian culture, and his relatives, those Italians in the periphery, or the new center of Italian-American culture and provide him with an unforgettable event. Whereas the expectations of foreignness or otherness is assured since the meal takes place outside of Italy proper, it becomes clear that there is a common shared understanding of Italian food which closes the distance between the geographical spaces. And we can consider this a connectivity through food consumption and it operates as a sort of culinary and cultural Wi-Fi, metaphorically speaking connecting Paracecoli with family across the temporal space forming a sort across time and space, right? Across history, present and past, a sort of culinary interdimensionality, right? Moreover, we must realize that everyone has their own interpretation of food, the food they consume, and what it means to them, because the act of eating is meeting creation. Yet how did the recipes arrive here, we ask? arrive there, since I'm here in Italy, memes, right, offer us a neutral explanation of the Italian signs transit from their point of origin in Italy, a center, to the, to the tables of diasporic families in the United States, the periphery. And again, as we were saying, perhaps I mentioned earlier, perhaps I did not, memes are just cultural values or ideas that are spread from person to person. So when we take the example of the metaphor of the Italian immigrant, when they came over with their collection of recipes, they were importing Ideas of knowledge, ideas and knowledge into the United States that then spread through their families. They replicated. They came down through generations. Not one person uh, that will watch this will say, well, they all have family recipes. Um, and I would also draw you to, if you're interested in some family recipes, uh, one of the most famous cookbooks, recipe book in Youngstown area is the Angels and Friends cookbook that's on, I believe, its 7th, 10th, 12th printing uh, that was uh, put out by the Easter Seals Foundation. So I do believe that they still produce those, and if they don't, you can find a copy. Uh, but I definitely recommend every Italian family, every family in the Mahoning Valley has the Angels and Friends. They have the Bible. They have the Angels and Friends. I mean, it's, it's uh, something that's easy to find on the bookshelves. 
One way of interpreting the flow of recipes is memes, right? Shared ideas that spread through people. Uh, and the materia primaria, or primary raw material that originated with immigrants, Italian immigrants, is to look at how the food culture of Italy influences people and their, how the sh that shapes their understanding of Italian culture in the center as well as the periphery, Youngstown. And an unbroken sequence of convivial sepiatone representations of Italy, though, shifting to how we see things in the media of it, chefs, cooks, and TV producers have found their own recipe for propagating and enforcing the meme of Italianess or Italianita. So much of what we consider Italian comes to us through the media. I know most people might be aware of it, uh, but it does have a reality-shaping effect on us. This meme is particularly strong in English-speaking countries with large historic populations of Italian immigrants such as the United States and Canada. Now moving on, into the introduction to the special edition for the Italian American Review entitled Cucina Nostra, Italian American Foodways on Television from uh, Roberto Cavallero, they state, quote, Italian American Foodways once marked the culture as different. But programs and celebrities like these have helped to commodify ethnic identity to the point that ethnically specific foodways have been transformed into mainstream U.S. culture and are now, therefore, consumable by the masses, end quote. Essentially, this seems to imply that due to the wave of ethnic cooking programs, Italian-American cooking has become had become mainstream, almost American like spaghetti meatball or pizza, people consider that American. In fact, uh, Marinaccio, 2016, states as much when he says, quote, culinary programming has gained enormous popularity and media presence since the late 1990s. It is precisely this popularity that can cause an effect on the periphery and shape non-Italian interpretations of Italy as a cultural system. Often Italy, and by extension Italian, right, Italian, loses all meaning and then becomes a sort of placeholder or general, general category of food in the U.S., but wholly ahistorical at this point. Marinaccio looks to Robert Orsi's 1985 conception of what he refers to as domus. Domus is Latin for home or hearth, place where you live. Uh, looks at Orsi's conception of the domus as a theater and places this target squarely on the kitchen. When defining the overall visual aesthetic, the Italianate frame is used by people to create an idea of Italy, right? So when we inter interact with Italian food and Italian culture in the valley, we are creating an idea of Italy. It is through the requisition of this, quote, ethnic culinary capital that actual capital and public interest is generated through dining establishments, customers, and quite fitting for these days, Italian festival attendees. Writing on the centrality of food to diasporic Italians in the 1920s and 30s, specifically Italian-American identity, Simone Cinotto states that three main reason, the three main reasons were, quote, first, the power of food to create and support family and community in the world of culture and material stress. Poverty. Second, the importance of the food trade in the Italian immigrant economy. And third, the symbolic value of food and the self-representations that helped Italians understand who they and who they are and whom they aspire to be. End quote. Applicable to the general state of ethnic culinary life, these three attributes form an efficient trichotomy for interpreting Italian cuisine and foodways. Interestingly, cooking shows and celebrities have helped to commodify ethnic identity to the point that ethnically specific foodways have been transformed into mainstream U.S. culture and are now, therefore, consumed en masse through different modalities and across a multitude of locations. It can be said that by their style and construction of Italianness and their discourse, these chefs embody the aesthetics of what is referred to in Italian as, quote, la dolce vita, or the sweet, good life. In short, Italy and Italian culture have and continue to be a big, tasty business ripe for the picking, which we consider exploitation when we look at it in the media sense. To quote Paracecoli again, 
as the diffusion and success of Italian food is turning into a true global phenomenon, Italian-American culinary habits are also eliciting growing attention in the U.S. and abroad, partly due to the visibility of Italian-Americans and their cultural practices in various forms of popular culture, including fashion, movies, television, and a growing number of books and cookbooks presented both traditional and innovative recipes." End quote. Peter said this in 2014, but this is just as applicable today. So here we can clearly recognize the memes of production in Italian-American culture, the commodified spaces that we inhabit and participate in. The popularity of the Italian memeplex. A memeplex is a connection or a collection of mutually occurring Italian signs. Um, though never expressly called as such, has been the underlying mechanism of cultural transmission via, via dysphoric Italian-Americans as vectors. Italian-Americans spread their culture, spread their recipes. Moreover, due to this popularity, as Parasecoli calls it, in the periphery, it is not only people of Italian descent that acquire these memes as it would be in, say, Italy. In a certain sense, these ethnic-based memes have crossed through a metaphorical osmotic barrier, if you remember your biology, and can now be spread by those of non-Italic origins in social spaces that are not semiotically, that is, the world of signs, or expressly Italian. And of course, in Youngstown, many families have multiple ethnicities to tap into from meaning and guidance for meaning and guidance in their lives. Because as we all know, one of the common things occurrence with Italian families is many Italians married outside of their Italian family. And there's many reasons for that, but usually it was because uh, first generation born Americans of Italian descent, there was really not a lot, of, they had more of a community since they were actually Americans, they were the born ones. So a lot of them married, so to speak, into America, as opposed to, uh, perhaps marrying somebody else of Italian descent. So when looking at food consumption, we can also think of it as a ritual, and we can consider the table as a ritual encounter. The concept of a ritual pertains to codified customs encompassing faith, festivals, festivities, and the sociological importance of food consumption. Aspects of religion and the ancillary events and values surrounding Roman Catholicism, marriage and divorce, baptism, communion, confirmation, pilgrimage, and any other social events in the parish operates as another area of meaning creation. Since food is a de facto figurative religion in Italian culture, it would make sense to include it as a ritual due to the level of structure and understanding required to produce it. Consumption practices around the table as altar and what it means to really eat is quite possibly the quintessential cultural experience. We consume foods that have been prepared by either following text memories, or a combination of both. In a, in a certain sense, recipes are the memes that have traveled from Italy as center to each and every periphery while diasporic Italians uh, have brought them. And in a matter, in a, and, but in fact, all human culture have been seizing these memes of culinary production to create a familiar transcendent experience, thereby creating and spreading memes via encoding and decoding the domestic and public event. Food in the lay society has been a, quote, symbol of collective identity for Italian Americans through memoirs, literature, poetry, and the visual arts, end quote, Chinotto again. But it has also been looked at critically, so much so that scholars have observed the consumption of Italian food as, quote, an act of self-identification and pride for Italians and an occasion for asserting cultural and political claims, end quote. The importance of the table as a communal place in the Domus is a way in which Italians continue to exercise Italianità or the Italianness. And in the case of North Americans, American Italianità, fundamental to Italian, Ameri Italian families, la tavola, the table, acts symbolically as a domestic altar where generations of family have eaten, exchanged emotions, ideas. The table is altar as a religious experience, and the food culture that, it consum that encompasses it is a mimetic data transmission platform, a way of spreading ideas helping to continue a connection between diasporic, diasporic, peninsular, and insular Italian communities. This is that connection I was talking about with Italy as center. Often what makes results, that which is placed upon the table becomes a discussion in and of itself. For example, in terms of what constitutes real Italian food like we were talking about, and cooking and whether the manifestations are in fact authentic. Food consumptions and food in general serves as a connective tissue of a family body keeping diverse parts continually functioning together. This metaphorical tissue 
keeps the component parts moving in unison as well as at times working together to actually prepare the food. From times past and into the future, an intergenerational conversation continues by way of food consumptions. So text and audiovisual programming offer an interpretation of the food, use of food as a facilitator in Italian family, which thus becomes an ideological framework which shapes and transmits the notion of Italian family as a class system. This system would be the social safety net for the immigrant in America, the immigrant in Youngstown, but would go on to cause problems for subsequent generations who, while being Italian in the home, were living in non-Italian world outside of it. Or, in other words, food and the table as domestic ritual provided the context for codifications of being Italian while in the periphery. Interestingly, it was through immigration that food culture and some dialects were preserved. In the Mahoning Valley, for example, many southern Italian food traditions still exist, the pizzelle from the Abruzzo Molise region, uh, an Italian wedding soup or uh, minestra maritata. Wedding soup was potentially one of the misnomers was is that it was considered something that was eaten at weddings. But maritata means just uh, melding or wedding the meatball, the chicken, the beef, the pork, sometimes the escarole, and other things that were put in the wedding soup. Okay, so it was marrying the flavors together, and of course, the Briar Hill pizza. All these have Italian regional histories that survive and continue into today. These foods as rituals signify an authentic expression of Italianità in the periphery. One of the truly unique things is what is referred to as, as Briar Hill Pizza. Now, Briar Hill Pizza is kind of a bit of a mystery. Uh, we kind of have ideas of its origin, but nobody is really quite sure. And I don't really even think that that's quite the point. Often and people search for authenticity, they think that there's some defining truth. And in reality, there isn't. Tony Trollio in Briar Hill, USA, kind of says that uh, his family is one of the people responsible for the uh, creation of this Southern Italian, as they say, uh, delicacy. So from his book, he says, quote, What's more Italian than pizza? I'll give you two guesses. Give up? The final answer, the original Briar Hill Pizza. Who introduced it in this country? The wives of the first immigrants who settled in Briar Hill. Those who settled here from southern Italy. What makes these Italian pies so unique? The crust, which is made by hand. The use of everything fresh and very little in the way of artificial ingredients. There's fresh Romano cheese, homegrown tomatoes, peppers, and that special secret sauce, which is only found in the original Briar Hill pizzas. Trollio goes on to say that, I don't want to brag, but Mama Nicolette, my mother, excelled in the making of Southern Italian, Basilicata to be exact, pizza. She was taught by her mother in Colabraro. I imagine the making of this pizza and the great sauce goes back generations before her and her mother. This is not to imply the other immigrant ladies made inferior pizzas. Their pizzas may have varied a little from house to house, but they were the pizzas made in southern Italy, and often you couldn't tell the difference. They were all great eating, end quote. Now, many people claim uh, Briar Hill Pizza uh, as uh, their own, and, and this is because it's something that was made in the families. Now, up on the hill, uh, it's common knowledge that, you know, my grand grandfather used to say that Tuesday was bread day, and this is a something that was actually supported by a oral transcript in the Ohio History uh, Archive that you can find at Mog Library. You can access it online. But they also confirmed that Tuesday was bread day. So again, when we see Briar Hill Pizza, it has its origin in a kind of communal uh, creation. Uh, and a consumption of something in the family. And it's still eaten today. You can go every Friday uh, and order pizzas and get them up at St. Anthony's Church on Turin, on the city's north side. Of course, talking about foodways in Youngstown, I'd be remiss not to mention the pizzelle, the pizzelle. Jerry, I made a whole batch of pizzelles just for you. I know how you like the anisette. Mm -hmm. Now, this is probably one of the most 
famous cookies from the area. We know them our whole lives. We grew up teething on pizzelle. They're given to us at holidays, special events, uh, weddings. You'll find them at uh, the cookie tables. Generally, you don't find this all throughout Italy. And when you do encounter them, they're usually called ferretelle. The origin of them is Abruzzo and Molise and Lazio. Uh, and these are regions that border. Now, the origin of this cookie is actually Roman. And they refer to it as a crustellum. One of the things in foodways is the economics of food and how circumstances in an area can change food consumption practices. So this, the history becomes important. As people live longer, established cultural centers sometimes move on to create new centers and with them new peripheries emerge. This happens much more in places like the U.S. where more often than not work is the defining factor of where people and families choose to live and not, like in Italy, ethnic attachment to place and material culture. This was the main reason that Briar Hill ceased to be an Italian enclave. Yet we should not be under the illusion that only Italians lived in Briar Hill because the hill was always a place for immigrants and migrants to go, to come and go, back and forth. Youngstown, like many other mid-sized industrial American cities, was in the precarious situation of being between two poles, Cleveland, Ohio, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. These industrial cities, along with manufacturing, made the steel belt an area of the U.S. with a relatively high standard of living, which would have an effect on what foods families had access to and who would be living in certain areas. But they would also pull people out of Youngstown as the city's fortunes drastically changed after 1977. So due to this former economic success and then decline, we have to take the good with the bad, after all. The multi-ethnic culture of the area also benefited from the development of social capital seen in the festivals all around Mahoning Valley, many of which still continue today. This is accomplished due to the consistency of the festivals and their promise of authenticity for the valley. In July and August, people can attend the Youngstown Mount Carmel Italian Festival, the Lowellville Mount Carmel Society Festival, the Greater Youngstown Italian Fest, and the Briar Hill Festival. Just outside the county, north of the city of Youngstown, there is also the Warren Italian American Festival. These events are opportunities for people to tap into and revisit their ethnic origins, history, and eat, and to show the flag as green, white, and red, the tricolore, the tricolors of the Italian flag, permeate everything at these events. So when you go to festivals, Italian American festivals, you notice that there is memorabilia being sold, whether it be t-shirts or mugs. Now this is interesting and one important distinction needs to be made is that Italian Americans advertise their ethnic identity in the multi-ethnic United States as opposed to in Italy where for more or less everyone is quote unquote Italian. Um, often uh, Italian Americans employ strategies to make their cultural expressions stand out by the use of conspicuous colors. A palette of green, white, and red or as often as the case sepia toned images of a bucolic old looking Italy that remote bucolic past, these are two of the most diffused and repetitive ways uh, that Italian Americans uh, advertise this ethnicity or exercise it. Modern day ritualistic events, these festivals uh, encode signs through these memes, Italian memes, in those diasporic Italians who may or may not uh, have much, if any, contact with Italy. So what I'm saying is, is that our contact with Italy comes to us through the regional festivals that we engage in in the United States, in Youngstown. And then we engage with Italian cuisine or Italian American cuisine at these festivals. And again, this might be some people's only contact with Italy through Italian American culture. And there, the Italian language, uh, and crucial, uh, perhaps they might even get to encounter peninsular Italian, uh, uh, actual Italian people from Italy. It's the public's chance to, quote, get their Italian on by eating cavatelli, cavatel, sausage and pepper sandwiches, and my favorite, elephant ears the size of hubcaps. Speaking of economy, one of the other fundamental ways of looking at food ways, one effect of industrial collapse and mass unemployment is that people begin to fall back on the social and ethnic spheres of their local neighborhoods and parishes, which provide cultural and spiritual guidance. Even if the ethnic concentrations were declining, the improvement of wages due to collective bargaining helped people improve the material conditions of their lives 
but also had the inverse effect of seeing many families move out of the traditional ethnic enclaves, including Briar Hill. Many of these places have been created through a relatively rigid class system that went into creating them from about 1910 into the 1950s. While neighborhoods often reflected an ethnic concentration, ethnicity was not the primary determinant of residency. Income level and housing costs tied to occupation were the most important determination of where, works, of where workers lived. The existence of ethnic and racially demarcated working class neighborhoods was a result of industrial labor recruitment. This is from Bruno, 1999. In the wake of these economic and cultural selection pressures, coupled with the pro progression of Italian immigrant families into American culture, a revival of eth Italian as ethnic experience began to emerge in the valley as a pushback to cultural assimilation. Unique to not only Italian immigrant families, other immigrant groups also traveled the same path. And in this ethnic revival, food would have been fundamental for a way to show ourselves as being ethnic. By this time, excuse me, many of the ethnic communities had moved out into the suburbs, so an ethnic experience became traveling into town for the, quote, Briar Hill Festival, um, or to attend St. Anthony's Church, or Mount Carm, or going to Lowellville, or going into uh, Mount Carmel, uh, again, going maybe to your parish. Um, but then again, as the suburbs emerged, Italian delicacy stores were already out there, the Laritia's chief amongst which, and the Old Borman Plaza and now off of Mark. So due to the mill closures, ethnicity would be decoupled from specific areas of the cities as many families continued moving into the surrounding suburbs and reconstruct new Italian-American experiences just as their immigrant families had done before them when they arrived in Youngstown. So as you can see, again, uh, as I, someone who descended of Italians, have moved back to Italy, closing that circle, the same thing, we are continually opening and closing new circles. When I think of the ethnic experience in the Mahoning Valley, I think of a poem by Felix Stefanile, The Americanization of the Immigrant. Your words, Genovefa, through the open window, tell me once again what to buy at the store. Don't forget, don't forget, aroma of fresh bread, almost a halo. That was a long time ago. I never forgot. Like Dante, I have pondered and pondered the speech I was born with. Lost now, mother gone, the whole neighborhood bulldozed, and no one to say it on the TV, that words are dreams. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed these meditations on food and culture. I want to thank Bill Lawson and Mahoney Valley Historical Society. And I also want to say that, remember that authenticity is something that is very subjective and it's how we engage in culture uh, today that matters. So take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and get out there and engage in culture. Thanks, ciao. Our next virtual Bites and Bits program will premiere at noon on Thursday, August 19th. The title is Youngstown as Gretna Green, and look at our history as a place for couples to elope. Our speaker will be local author Rosalind Torella. We hope you will tune in to learn more.